to schools, people don't go to church, all the institutions that create guardrails and behavior have been, have been compromised. And so this is a problem we're gonna to have to deal with under these new terms. I personally think that the courts have been reluctant to retain um, young people who have gun charges. Young people, by the way, you're 25, you're still a young person. It's not like you're, you know, you're not a super adult, you're still fairly young. And nobody wants to, in this environment, no one wants to put people in prison where there is a reputation for COVID and everything else. And so we think, you know, it's our experience that people who shouldn't be back out on the streets are back again. When you talk about the gang, Belda talked about gangs, it's what happens. Somebody who's part of the gang goes in, gets let out, they go right back and commit crimes again. We had someone a week ago who posted bail, came out and got shot himself two hours later. I mean, so we, what we have to wrap it up. Yeah, we just have to start understanding what the nature of the problem is if we're going to solve it. Okay. Justin? Uh, thank you. Uh, when we think about uh, the problems that we're facing, uh, there's a number of approaches that we need to take. Uh, one is there are a number of faith-based organizations that are in high poverty and high crime areas. We're going to have to start uh, working with them. I remember the Bethany Church on 27 West they used to have homework in a sandwich. I volunteered there. I remember Bethany and me had the Sons of Allen's had the Thursday Club. These types of programs we will have to partner with uh, our faith-based communities and ensure that they are helping uplift our communities. Also, while on council, I created a diversity plan. The diversity plan was for any contractor that uh, received a, a contract from the city of Wilmington, that they created a plan on how they would uh, have local hiring to ensure that residents had an opportunity to work. Uh, I would also create a criminal justice advisory council that would look at the larger scope of what's going on when, as it pertains to violence in our community. Um, and also, our police department has to reflect the communities in which they represent. So when we think about that, we have to ensure, ensure that diversity is at the forefront and at the helm of what's going on and everything that we do. Uh, but we want to make sure that as we move uh, forward and what is taking place, that we are having a concerted effort from any number of things. Because again, our city uh, departments, again, have to remember they're not working in concert to the level they should uh, to, to ensure that the proper things are taking place, even down into uh, when uh, businesses come to uh, get uh, license and inspection and things of that nature. There's contrast from the fire marshal's office. So if there's infighting within our own departments, how can we do anything to clean up in the streets? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're moving on to something slightly less serious. The city removed the statues of Christopher Columbus and Caesar Rodney in June during nationwide protests for racial justice. What should be done with the statues next? This question goes to Mike first. Well, I don't, I don't know that it's not serious. I think it's a very serious issue. Uh, there were people who felt very strongly about those statues. We just had to look across the country and see that uh, statues of Christopher Columbus were being defaced and taken down. Uh, there were hard field. There's, I think we haven't figured out the way we're going to deal with our founding fathers. We don't know where the line is. Is it the Civil War or before? What is the how are we going to memorialize the people who came before us? So I think it's an immensely serious conversation that what we have. I took down those two statues because I knew there were going to be protests, there were planned, and what I didn't want to do is have there be violence and damage on those two statues and let it become uh, more of an issue than it had to be. So I asked, I directed that they both be taken down, they're both in storage. And we're still, we're still going through this process of, of trying to understand. No, I'm not trying. We're, we want to find the best thing to do with those statues, but we want it to be consensus, a consensus drawn from the community about that. I have my own ideas. I think, uh, I think we have to memorialize black history as much as we do American history, which is certainly, it is American history. When we have an exhibit in our in our lobby in the city county building, it says black history is American history and we memorialize the lives of 20 African Americans. So I would hope that when we bring these statues back, what's, what's presented is a very powerful, even handed perspective on our history. And we're gonna to talk to the folks in this community about how we, how we express that. All right, Justin. Uh, thank you. Uh, honestly, uh, uh, the statues, uh, they're going, so they're going. Uh, I think that when we think about our city, we think about what's taking place, uh, the mayor 
uh, had alluded to um, he didn't want violence to take place uh, in our in the downtown. That has already taken place. So that's a loss of revenue, loss of uh, income uh, that is taking uh, hit by the city. Uh, again, what's going on with the uh, economic uncertainty and the global pandemic that we find ourselves in. Uh, but what I would do is I would look to the, the, the residents of our city and get suggestions from them as to what they think should take place and take an overall consensus. But as of right now, they're gone uh, and they uh, did not serve a purpose uh, that what spoke to unity within our community and we want to restore the neighbor back in neighborhood. So it has to be cohesiveness and we can't just look at things from a uh, one lens. We have to look at it from a citywide lens, making sure they're representing all of Wilmington for we are Wilmington. Valda? Um, well, I believe that there is need for a larger dialogue around all of the race and justice issues with regard to our city. Um, when it comes to memorializing our history, we, we need to memorialize history that is positive, that's reflective of um, the treatment of people across our whole city that we be proud of. And I think if we use that as a, as a base for um, the essence of what we want to memorialize in our history, that will help guide us in, in what's important to have in, in monuments. But more importantly, I think, are the issues of Rodney Square itself and the displacement of people and the lack of access to transportation that, um, that changing the transportation hub in the way that it was done created in the first place. More importantly is uh, justice for um, people in our community like Jeremy McDole, who five years ago was uh, tragically shot while sitting in his wheelchair and where there's still swirls around um, all sorts of uh, concerns as to the um, authenticity and the transparency of what might have happened surrounding that situation and where his family still seeks justice. So I think um, we need to keep our eye on the larger, um, more uh, essential issues, and that's not to minimize the importance of symbolism and moralizing, but I think it's important that that be guided by the positive history that we want to preserve and promote. All right, thanks for your answer. Um, I'm glad that you brought that up because I do want to um, ask a question about uh, police reform. So there's been some proposals um, regarding police reform in Wilmington, such as a civilian review board or stricter city residency requirements that are restricted by state laws, um, including the state's Law Enforcement Bill of Rights, which really restricts the uh, the distribution or public um, public viewing of certain police disciplinary records. As mayor, would you support and go to Dover to loosen certain state laws so that um, Wilmington's police reform efforts can move forward? This question goes to Justin first. Um, I believe that we have to, um, again, as mayor, advocate uh, for the city. We have to ensure that uh, if we're going to restore the public trust, uh, they must know that no one is above the law, uh, that we all must respect the law. And in doing so, uh, there are a number of things that have to change, and we will advocate to make sure that we're representing all of Wilmington, not just the police, but we have to represent our community community and make sure that our neighborhoods uh, feel safe as a result of everything that's taking place and restore the public trust. That's part of what the Bobby cameras were for, uh, to ensure, ensure that there's public trust, continuity with relationships. So we would go to Dover to advocate uh, for some changes to ensure that we can move our city forward and kind of begin the healing process and cultivate uh, as we try to get through and get out of and, and make sure that civil unrest does not continue to happen. It doesn't, of course, happen here. Valda? Um, I believe that we need to, um, to create a culture of, of trust and engagement between our um, law enforcement professionals and our community, where we're partnering to, uh, to protect and ensure our 
uh, neighborhoods in our communities are safe. I do believe that we need to relook and 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 revisit with Dover um, those aspects of the law that don't support and facilitate that. Um, we are in a time where uh, transparency is imperative. Um, and that's good for all of us. It's good for our law enforcement officers and it's it's good for the public. And, and so, yes, I do believe we need to, to look in its entirety at our, um, our police bill of rights. We need to look at the way in which we engage the community um, and, and we need to do all of those things to, to, to change the culture and the way in which uh, our community and our public safety professionals engage with one another so that we work together for the benefit of protecting our citizens and having a safe community in all corners of our city. Mike? So I thought the question is about civilian review. Um, and, you know, as a general proposition, obviously everybody's alluded to this, there are steps you have to take for there to be civilian oversight. I personally think civilian oversight is, is welcome. But, but it means it depends on the details. So if you say that civilian, uh, a civilian oversight board has the ability to hire and fire, as some people suggest, I would oppose that. If you say that we have access to everybody's personnel files, I would oppose it because you don't have access to anybody in finance or human resources either. I think that uh, there, is a, there would be a threshold where, where those files may very well be accessible. I would say I favor when a police officer leaves one jurisdiction and goes to another one, then those files ought to go with them so that they understand what kind of problems he had in the past. Because nothing is worse than finding out that you hired somebody who's got a problem, but that everybody knew he had a problem before and you didn't know about it. So I think these are kind of the devils in the details. Body cams were 100% for them because we believe, as was just said, they support police officers as much as they do the community. But people would understand. When, with limited amounts of money, when we asked members of the public to own body cameras or neighborhood cameras, everybody wanted neighborhood cameras. So that was just, that's the message you got loud and clear. Clearly, clearly some members of council wanted body cameras, but I'm just telling you, our experience was in the neighborhoods. It was, it was neighborhood cameras is what they wanted, security cameras. All right, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to some questions that were submitted to us um, by viewers and hopefully residents in Wilmington. Um, this first one, okay, it's a little long. Disinvestment in Wilmington neighborhoods takes the form of out of town landlords buying homes vacated by those who move away and then renting them for exorbitant amounts while not maintaining those properties. How do we disrupt the extraction of money from our communities and ensure that these properties provide safe and healthy housing for those who need it? This question goes to Velda first. Um, well, I believe that we discontinue the practice of se selective enforcement. As we currently um, have a far too heavy handed um, enforcement effort when it comes to uh, individual homeowners and residents here in the city and, um, and we don't enforce uh, with equal um, vigor those who either have uh, owned large numbers of properties and uh, basically operate as uh, slum landlords um, or those who are even on an individual basis uh, vacant and missing uh, in action. Um, and so I believe we need to uh, very heavily enforce um, the city's current laws uh, against those, um, those landlords. And we don't currently do that. We're far too selective in, um, in our enforcement effort. And unfortunately, that's not one that, that we target and, and address with enough vigor. Mike? Not a hard question for me. If um, I don't want anybody coming here preying on the city, preying on tenants, and then picking up and extracting that wealth from the city. 
the the solution to that is to have a vigorous selection uh, enforcement process. Every time, every time somebody gets gets a, a some sort of a ticket, every time someone goes out there and gets uh, an enforcement action, they say selective enforcement. I just don't believe it. I've been around. I've been around our L and I inspectors for a long time. I think they're an outstanding bunch and they do tough work. But the bigger issue is it takes us six and seven months to get in the court with somebody who is a slumlord. Now, you're not going to come in here and profiteer. It's not going to be profitable for you if when you don't ma manage your property and keep it up, that you're getting you're getting hit with a $250 fine every single week that you're not complying with the law. And that's what we try to do with our so-called blight ordinance. It was the best, it would be the best ordinance that would ever happen to this city. And we had the resistance on the city council who, resi who wouldn't, uh, wouldn't support it. Sam Guy, Sam Guy set the exact same ordinance in and retitled it the gentrification of ordinance of 2019. That's the mentality that whatever we were trying to do had to be, it had to be confused with gentrification. And of course, we, we were never able to get uh, the votes to do it. That's the way to take care of somebody who's coming into profiteer in our city. Uh, Justin? Yes, uh, I think that we kind of touched on this point earlier. Uh, as mayor, you have to cast vision. And in casting vision, we again have to ensure that our uh, departments are working together to ensure that we create the opportunities that we want for our city and for our residents. Uh, we already discussed the land bank is uh, not done its job and that would be an option of something that could help and relieve. We need to ensure that we're creating the uh, affordable housing, first-time home buyers programs, but we also want to create multimodal housing, which would give us desirable housing stock for individuals to reside in. Unfortunately, uh, if this mayor wasn't so concerned about building apartments at the University of Delaware, uh, rather than building up our communities and our neighborhoods, maybe he would uh, probably have a better uh, gauge on what's taking place uh, here in our city. So we want to make sure uh, that we look at that. And then when we think about management from a management standpoint, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, our treasurer was the chief strategy officer for previous administration and the management and the poor management of those departments. We had high turnover in the planning, public works, HR, finance, parks and rec, and constituent services. So when we talk about management and making sure that our departments are working cohesively, we have to ensure that we make sure that our departments are doing their job, that we're integrating to move together and move our city forward and create a housing stock that is desirable for the residents of the city of Wilmington. Um, next question submitted by the public. Given the transient nature of Wilmington's population, what efforts will you pursue to retain and attract young talent to the city? Question goes to Mike first. Listen, uh, we... Cities either grow or they die. So they either develop and grow or they die. You become Chester. And so what we've done, what we've done is in recognition of all the jobs we lost, by the way, prior to our getting our, our being here, we've taken a different tack. The city, the city survives on wage tax. We have a fairly stable property tax base, but it survives on an increasing wage tax. And we get wage tax whether you work here or whether you live here, and it doesn't make any difference. So for us, if for us, the strategy is let's build housing so people want to move here, and let's build a city that's worthy of the people who live here and want people, and, and a city that makes people want to come here. And that to me is the strategy. And it's, are we transient? Are we any more transient than any place, place else? I don't think so. I really don't think so. I mean, I know neighborhoods where people live for 40 and 50 years, and of course, you've got young people who come and go, but they come and go in New York City and, and Philadelphia. So I don't, I don't view this as a transient city. And I think we have so many great housing options that people can plant a, plant a, uh, you know, a, a flag here and stay here. I think that uh, it's condominiums, apartments, it's a redevelopment of our existing housing stock. There's plenty to stay here for. We shouldn't be we shouldn't be giving you this notion that we're a transient city. What we ought to be doing is deal with the poverty that we have to deal with, 27% poverty, and uplifting our poor communities. That's what we have to do to make a better city. Uh, Justin. All right, thank you. Um, when we think about uh, the transient, as you stated, 
uh, residents in our city, uh, we have done uh, a horrible job of investing in our neighborhoods. So we have to invest in our neighborhoods and invest in our citizenry. Uh, when we think about uh, what is taking place uh, in the city, uh, it is apparent to me uh, that we need to be uh, better stewards uh, as to um, leading uh, the city, uh, as to uh, ensuring that, um, I lost my train of thought to be honest. Can you uh, get that back to me? You want me to repeat the question? Please. Uh, given the transient nature of Wilmington's population, what efforts will you pursue to retain and attract young talent to the city? Oh, thank you. Um, just just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the heavy way came to 300 North Market Street. Again, it's about creating neighborhood economic inclusion and making sure that we have our young people, that they have a voice, that they know that they're a part of our community and that we build and support them. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we do that and cultivate those relationships with our young people. Uh, again, being a small business owner, a young one at that, um, I know the importance of making sure that we connect the dots with other their small business owners and give them the pointers that they need, the assistance that they need. And again, through uh, our, our Department of Procurement on our process that we will create, we will make sure that we have the uh, technical assistance that they need uh, to move forward and, and better create uh, opportunities. Valda? Well, the first thing is we, we can't continue to meet our young people with hostility and with closed arms. We've got to create an environment and a culture within our city where young people feel a part of this city, where things that they have an interest in, um, they see an opportunity to bring to life. We've got to tap into their innovation and we've got to in many ways, just frankly, get out of the way and allow them to, uh, to bring forward their new innovative ideas. We've got to, um, to be willing to take some prudent risk to allow them to, uh, to bring forward those new uh, creative ways of, of doing things. Um, entertainment, the arts, mixed use development uh, for, for properties. Um, the homes are going to be our new offices. And so we've got to create uh, a whole new formula for, um, for how new businesses are going to be, what they're going to look like. And frankly, young people, I believe, have more of the answer to that question than any of us on this call right now. All right, thank you. Um... So we're um, still taking questions from the audience. If you want to submit them in Facebook comments on the uh, original Wilmington Democrats Facebook Live video, um, we can look at your questions. So I'm going to go back to some of my prepared questions um, while we wait for questions to roll in. Um, let's see. Uh, the Delaware minimum wage is $9.25 an hour, but the National Low Income Housing Coalition finds that you'd need to make closer to $18 an hour to afford a one bedroom apartment. How can the city ensure that the development of new housing keeps the city affordable for all? This question goes to Justin first. Uh, as I stated before, being the mayor, you're an advocate for the entire uh, city of Wilmington. Uh, some of those decisions that you're talking about have to come from a state level that you would have to create uh, a network and that you would have to have an open door relationship where you can advocate for the citizens of Wilmington to ensure that those avenues are available to have housing. Um, from a smaller standpoint, uh, as I alluded to earlier about the diversity plan, ensuring that uh, local residents, we have the jobs that are here uh, to assist them. Uh, also, when we think about uh, our departments, we have to ensure that our departments are working together uh, so that we can ensure housing is there and the opportunities are there. And as I alluded to, uh, we have to increase uh, quality and affordable housing, uh, as I mentioned, uh, through the multimodal uh, neighborhood process. Also, um, housing and rehabilitation programs. Those are a number of things that we have to implement to ensure that houses are, are able to be afforded by our residents. So it's an it's a approach that takes more than just uh, one uh, situation. There's not just a cure-all, 
but it takes integration and it takes working together and having right minds at the table and ensuring again that we are working uh, with our, our state delegation as it pertains to minimum wage and a number of other things that can uh, assist our city uh, and our residents. And also we have to make sure that um, from a state standpoint that we have uh, th those entities working together, as I alluded to earlier, Governor Markell brought up the IADAP program, which had, uh, you know, the uh, Labor, Department of Labor, and other uh, secretaries within our state that are working together to ensure that we create opportunities to advance our city and our people. Valda. Um, I, I believe fundamentally that it is important that the, um, that our state adopts a higher minimum wage. We really need people to earn at a level that gives uh, minimally a livable wage. And I would, um, would lobby and advocate with Dover to ha help move the state in that direction. Um, the price of housing is in, to a large extent uh, dependent on supply and demand. And I believe we need to, to look at our city planning process, at our city plans. We need to to revisit our, uh, our, our zoning um, and our plans for rezoning to, uh, to also begin to look at what our supply of housing is and uh, what zoning um, changes there might be appropriate that will help sort of mitigate the, the supply and demand issue. Um, I, the affordability of houses, uh, as we discussed earlier, with the, the city doing um, everything that it can to help, um, to help underwrite and support um, the creation of quality affordable housing. But it is a fact, I, I feel very strongly that we do need to see um, increased uh, hourly rates at the minimum wage level so that uh, there is greater affordability um, here in our state. All right, Mike. So it's a, it's a big question with a long answer, but I would say, let me just try to distill it down. Since 1980 in this country, uh, the incomes of people at the bottom half of the income scale have dropped and the incomes, particularly at the top, have gotten much, much, much greater. And so today, I think when you look at, when you look at, um, the protests that go on in this country, you see a lot of people that you wouldn't expect to be in those protests. They're protesting their own their own personal circumstances. They're making X, and that X is used up in no time with a lack of health care, the cost of student loans, just the basic cost of living, and they're feeling under financial siege. So that is a condition that's happening in this country at large. I agree. I personally agree that a higher minimum wage is, is important. It's critical. But I also would say that that in the city of Wilmington, just to just to push back on your point, as soon as those apartments are built, they get occupied. The occupancy in all the new apartments is very, very high. So somehow somebody's figuring out a way to be here. They may not have as much disposable income afterwards as they had before, but but the public by and large is embracing the market cost of living in the city of Wilmington. We're 20 percent cheaper than they are in Philadelphia. It's a price advantage we ought to take advantage of. Okay, um, we have gotten a few questions um, from the public. Um, this is a good one. What is your take on the number of failing and closed school buildings in the city? What can be done to support our youth and in their education and programming? Um, this question goes to Velda first. Um, can you repeat it again, please? Sure. What is your take on the number of failing and closed school buildings in the city? What can be done to support our youth in their education and programming? Um, well, I believe Wilmington as a city should have control over its children's education. We are one of the only major cities in a state in this country that doesn't have its own high school and jurisdiction, uh, local control over the education of its children. Um, 
And so I believe we really need to uh, work with Dover and um, and restructure the, uh, the, 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 the school district system so that uh, our children aren't carved out into four different districts and through which our voice in their education is minimized so that we um, are not able to, uh, to have in place strong advocacy programs uh, within the schools and um, other initiatives that ensure that they're able to receive the kind of, frankly, education that they're entitled to. Um, with that local control, then we have the ability to address those facilities that are, are best um, needed to, uh, to house our children in, the resources that they need, such as um, techno access to technology and laptop computers. Um, it, it, to me, it comes down to uh, the, the city having local control over the education of our very own children. Uh, Mike? I thought the question was about what to do with the uh, vacant buildings. Sure. The question is about education in the city, the vacant school buildings, and supporting the youth in their education. Well, we don't have, uh, we're not unique in that regard. There are vacant buildings uh, all, over, all over the county, and I think it's a function of a school system that it was designed for X number of kids, and then we have the highest number of charter school uh, students, second highest in the country and the second highest private school uh, um, in the country as well. So what, what's happened is people have left our schools and we've got all these vacant buildings uh, all over. And uh, frankly, there's no easy answer what to do with a big old empty building because to repurpose it, which, which sounds so good, just costs a whole ton of money and someone's gonna have to pay for that. You know, I think what we wanna be doing uh, what we want to be doing is rethinking education from top to bottom. I really do. I mean, and as hard as that is, and I know politically it's really difficult, uh, but I have to tell you, any system where you have to ask the taxpayer whether they want a tax increase is never going to work. Any, any school system where you take kids from this side of the city, the, of this side of the county, and bust them on the other side of the county is just not going to work. We have 5% of some of our kids, so 5% of our kids can do math and grade in some of our high schools. There is no way to defend that system. So, you know, I am just a big advocate for change, which is why I'm on the Reading Consortium, which is why I attend all the meetings, which no mayor ever has done, because I believe that education is the key to the transformation of our city. And I want to see it happen, and I want to be part of that, uh, part of that discussion. Justin. Yes, uh, one, I think, I think it's important to note, while on council, uh, when the state was considering lowering the dropout uh, age, uh, we championed legislation to ensure that we didn't lower the age for dropouts. Um, I think it's important to note that these schools uh, that are here, that are vacant, we need to ensure that we are bringing back trade schools. We're bringing back other uh, uh, avenues of learning, other avenues of prosperity uh, for our children. We have schools that are vacant. As the mayor, we will bring the school districts together to figure out how we can better serve our children. Uh, we do need oversight uh, over what's taking place. Um, and so we need to make sure that education is at the forefront. Uh, when we think about the vacant schools, uh, that's prime time uh, for those facilities to be open. Uh, some of them are in areas that lack of uh, facilities and and community centers. So it's time to, again, use those facilities to ensure that we are uh, uplifting our communities and creating opportunities uh, for them. And so we wanna make sure that as a mayor of the city of Wilmington, we have to advocate for education. Again, we don't have a direct tie-in and that's not an answer or, or easy way out to say, hey, we don't have oversight in it, but we have to make sure that we're advocating making sure that we're using every resource possible uh, to, to, again, that, that speaks to blight. Uh, next thing you know, they'll be breaking into schools and things will be happening. So we have to make sure that we're repurposing, working with these school districts to ensure that we are uplifting our communities and creating avenues uh, of positive enrichment and reinforcement uh, for our young people in the city of Wilmington. Um, this next question from the public, um, as mayor, how would you encourage the city council to prevent in-house fighting and get the work done needed to transform the city? This question goes to Mike. Sorry. 
Okay. I said, that's an easy one. Just have an election and get rid of some of the people that just live for chaos. Uh, it's not, there's no, there's, there's no systemic way you do this. You just got individuals. We have people on council who call the president of city council a slave, who uses the worst racial epithet to another black member of council. There's no system that's going to change that. I mean, this, this is an unruly crowd. They're not serious about anything. They exist to disrupt. And it's a shame because we've got some very dedicated people trying to do the right thing. But we've got, we've got almost a half dozen people over there who just are not very serious about what they're, what they're doing. And frankly, there's just there's no way to deal with them. Uh, they, don't want to, they don't want to work with me. They've opposed virtually everything that we try to get done. And uh, I wish there were an easy way. If there was a formula, I'd, I'd certainly use it. But uh, as I said, they're just, they want to be against something not for something. Justin? When we think about what's going on uh, in, on Wilmington City Council, having served there, uh, I think that the council, uh, they are frustrated because they hear firsthand from the communities all the issues, the ills, and the problems that they're facing. And when you have an administration that does not ensure that they're reaching out for cohesiveness to all areas of our neighborhoods, if they're not reaching out across the aisle to ensure that we're cultivating relationships, then you have the problems that we have. I think that if the city of Wilmington and their representatives feel as though they are um, they have a mayor that is actually hearing from them, working with them, and not placing retribution against them in their neighborhoods, uh, as we know that um, uh, July, again, was one of the most violent times in our city, and uh, we're told that uh, sometimes the mayor's office, uh, they will hold back resources from various uh, districts because if you didn't vote for an initiative that they have or you're not playing nice with them, then they hold back. So we can't allow our citizens to suffer as a result of our systemic fighting and our personal cynical issues. So we have to rise above that. We have to ensure that we're given a fair chance to all residents in the city of Wilmington, and we have to work together. And at the end of the day, that's what it takes. Uh, that's why we're able to pass legislation while on council, because sometimes I needed six more votes. Sometimes you needed eight more, but you have to work together and have the heart of the community, have the soul of the community. And being from here, it makes a difference sometimes because you're value it just a little different and when you actually see what's going on because you're in the neighborhoods, then you feel a little differently too. Valdo? So I've been here for the last four years as part of this city government. Um, I've been present. I haven't been missing in action. And, um, and I believe what we need to do is have our government in all respects behave as the democracy that it's intended to be. Um, I believe we need all members who are elected to office by the public to be uh, respected for the offices that they've been elected to. Um, I believe there needs to be um, honor around the, uh, the, the roles that each elected officer has been entrusted with. And I believe it is then left up to the public to decide if they are pleased with what their individual elected officials are doing. And they speak their voice with their vote. So I encourage the empowerment of the public using their vote, their strongest voice, which is their vote, to hold each member, whether it's city council or the executive branch, the mayor, or any other elected officers, to hold them accountable for doing the job to their liking and to cast their vote accordingly. Thank you. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but Justin made a pretty serious allegation that the mayor's office withholds funds from certain city districts. So I just want to give Mike 30 seconds to respond to that. That's that's as vacuous a statement as anybody else has made all night. They just, you know, these allegations are simply ridiculous. This idea that we would hold up funds for a district because what, somebody didn't vote for me? It's just ridiculous. And if you're going to make that allegation, you ought to be specific about it so at least I can respond to it. 
Zach, Zach Turner doesn't vote for anything, and we've spent more money in West Center City than any place else in the city. So that just that argument doesn't hold water. All right, we're going to move on. Um, this question is from the public. Um, they want to know um, how you would address uh, another budget deficit in the future. Justin goes first. Okay, um, when we're talking about the budget, uh, we have to take an overarching look and we have to take a conservative approach for, for the next two years to get out of this pandemic. We'll have requirements uh, from uh, the city departments and identify areas to reduce our budget by 5%. We'll review all one-year contracts uh, that are up for renewal and make sure that those one-year contracts are absolutely needed. Uh, we will limit the outside training. Uh, also, uh, the 311 system just came into play. Uh, the $600,000 is used for it. I believe there's additional um, $200,000 added to this year's budget. We have to bring some services in-house and stop outsourcing a lot of our dollars. Uh, we want to also uh, look at the uh, annexation. Uh, we also would uh, create an amnesty program. There's a lot of indebtedness owed to the city, so if we could create an amnesty program to bring some of those dollars in immediately to help offset what is going on. Also, we have to look at uh, overtime and how we can focus on minimizing uh, the overtime that takes place in our city. Um, and then, uh, you know, unfortunately, because of all the things that have taken place uh, with some of the outsourcing, uh, there have been uh, jobs uh, lost. Uh, as a result, uh, people are bumping uh, union jobs and other things like that. Um, and then uh, also you take about property tax. The mayor said there was no property tax increase. The water uh, was increased uh, for the city residents, was not done for those that sublease water from the city. There was a 7% property tax increase when it came into office uh, and the water was 5%. So we have to look at everything uh, with a conservative look and make sure we approach these things prudently. Velda? Uh, so, um... I am the only finance professional and expert who is vying for uh, the office of mayor. Um, I have a track record of, of managing budgets, of identifying um, operating inefficiencies and saving significant sums of money in city government. And so I will review all aspects of our city's operation, much in the way I did when I came on board uh, to assist Mayor Jim Sills, when the city had four consecutive years of deficit spending. And in the 18 months I was on loan to the city from the DuPont company, guided the city through to a uh, $1.3 million surplus by finding $5.1 million in savings. Likewise, my experience as state treasurer, when I guided the state treasury through the uh, most significant financial crisis since the Great Depression in the 2008 recession. And so those experiences I will bring into the mayor's office to develop and establish a budget that allows us to reduce costs, uh, be as efficient as we possibly can, and to manage through what is going to be a, an economic challenge for this city post COVID-19 pandemic. All right, and Mike? So let's talk about budgets. We. I think I'm the first mayor to ever do five-year budgeting so that we came in office, we looked at our budget. We had, right out, right out of the box, we had a $55 million five-year budget deficit that we were staring. And we made very difficult decisions. And <clears throat> it's easy in this context to say, here's what I would do, I'll cut 5%. Wait till you find out who, who has to be fired when you cut 5%. And by the way, there have been no jobs lost at all in all the years I'm here. There has been no bumping as a result of jobs lost. Not one time, Justin, so I don't know where you got that information. But we do a, we do a five-year budget and we made tough decisions. We didn't fill positions for firefighters, which you know to this day has been a vexing problem in our city. But it was a difficult decision, but it was worth $2 million when we had to dig ourselves out of a major hole. 
Velda talks about all the money she saves uh, as treasure. Here's the truth. Velda can't save any money as treasurer. She can't save one penny. All of her suggestions, all the discussions go to the bond committee. The information comes in from bond council and the financial advisor, and Velda is one of three people who sit and talk about these things and decide what we want to do. So just, we want to be clear about how much money gets saved by the treasurer. Um, the budgeting, leaving from here, we're going to have to make some difficult decisions because there's no question about that coming out the other side of the budget, I think we're going to have some problems. But you ought to be counting on someone who's willing to make a tough decision. Thank you. Velda, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to respond to that. Yes, please do, because it's clear that even after three and a half years, this mayor does not understand the treasurer's office, the treasurer's role, and the bond committee's function. The bond committee's function is very limited, and it is limited to only a very specific structuring of bond deals. The ideas that come to that bond committee have come out of my office. The, the, the understanding the markets, the monitoring, the opportunity, the seeing the opportunity to refinance and refund that uh, currently has on the table a $7 million savings to refund and refinance existing bonds that the mayor and, and uh, Bud Friel have not brought to the bond committee for us to realize that could have been in the taxpayers' hands in the bank since May of this year. Those come out of the treasurer's office and out of our work. Can you wrap it up soon? Yes. So again, it's clear that the mayor doesn't understand was um, because otherwise he would recognize that savings that come from the refinancing of bonds as just one example come as a result of the work of my office identifying that opportunity. Okay, we're gonna have to wrap it up and we're also gonna move on because this is not Delaware Chancery Court and I realize that's a joke that only I find funny, but I couldn't resist telling it. Um, one more question from the public. Um, the arts are suffering a lot right now during the pandemic. How will arts play a role in the development of Wilmington? This question goes to Velda. Um, I believe the arts will play, have played an important role in our city. And frankly, I believe that it will play an increasingly important role and it should. Um, the arts is a, a source of creativity and pride that we have not tapped and allowed to flourish within the city. A lot of our, our the roots and the history of this city um, was born out of the arts. The east side of our city um, had some of the greatest uh, uh, performing artists and visual artists this country has ever seen. And once upon a time, that was celebrated in a way that we just haven't of late. We have young flourishing artists who are thriving and hungry for ways to bring that art to life. And we, this city, this administration has not created an environment that is welcoming and inviting to all the varieties of, of art and art expression. And so I believe that it's an important aspect of bringing pride back to our city, um, to really enriching our neighborhoods. And I'm going to be very excited under a Jones Potter administration to, uh, to facilitate that happening. Mike? Well, I've been a supporter of the arts uh, since my time as uh, executive director of uh, the Riverfront when we brought the uh, Delaware Center for Contemporary Arts down there, which became, which became the contemporary. Uh, we're big supporters of DCAD and the great work that they do. We are staunch supporters of the uh, of Opera Delaware and the um, and the Grand, because we don't believe that you can be a real live city if you don't have a vibrant arts program. The other day, I went out to this, the former stables down near Clifford Brown Walk, and we, we're putting together an art program out there that will be the envy of everybody uh, within miles. It's simply beautiful, and the number of kids that did the, the creative things that Bella was describing a moment ago is happening right here 
in our city in in a beautiful reconstruction of these old stables right next to the right next to the Wilmington bike project as well. So we are committed to the arts. We believe that cities can't be uh, they can't be real live grown up cities unless you've got a vibrant art program. And uh, we want to do everything we can to incentivize kids to express themselves. We have murals that we're doing. We've got a mural being uh, being developed on the side of the city county building. We did that beautiful uh, um, African art right across the top of Spencer Plaza. We want we want the city to be vibrant. We want it to look like real people live here. Thank you, Justin. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I will. I, this message popped up, threw me off a little bit. Um, but yes, we have to uh, ensure that we are cultivating the arts. Uh, you have Christina Cultural Arts Center. You have other avenues. They create positive outlets for our young people. Uh, we will increase uh, music venues and events that take place uh, in and around our city to ensure that we're uh, cultivating the arts as well. Um, so we want to make sure that that's a major and vital role within our city to ensure that our young people's voices are heard, that we're tapping into their talents and uh, things that are taking place. Uh, and we want to increase them throughout the city. Uh, the Clifford Brown Jazz Festival uh, that always takes place on uh, the previous administration. There's some wonderful jobs that were done uh, throughout uh, supporting the arts and throughout our city and expanding that base. So we want to make sure that we build upon those types of bases and venues that happen within our city. And so we want to make sure that theaters are is a, a major and vital role. Um, you have places like Pieces of a Dream uh, that offer dancing for our young people and artistic dancing. So we want to make sure that we're cultivating and strengthening those organizations and those programs in and around the city of Wilmington so that we can make sure that our children have a brighter future and have opportunity uh, to uh, move forward with positive outlet, positive enrichment. Um, and so uh, those are some of the things that we'll do, not to mention a lot of faith-based faith -based organizations that already offer these programs that we will help support and partner with to ensure uh, there are a number of churches and organizations that have arts within their uh actual core uh, of functions of the churches and facilities. So we wanna make sure that we continue to partner with them as well, because the city of government can't do everything, but we can support. All right, thank you. Um, last question before we go to closing statements. What is one thing you would do on day one of your administration? Um, question goes to Mike first. I think the first thing I would do is uh, reintroduce the ordinance uh, to uh, be as as uh, tough as we can be on our landlords and send the message that this, the, the success of the city depends on how we deal with rental properties. As we discussed before, 50% of the city is, is comprises rental properties. Uh, if you live on a street and you've got neighbors who don't take care of it, Guaranteed, most of them are rental properties. 50% of the city's rental properties, 75% of the, of the violations are rental properties. We don't have the teeth to enforce our codes. We need, we need to be able to get into court if necessary at all quickly, but we need to be able to impose fines and let, let the landlord go appeal it somewhere. But meanwhile, those fines are attaching to that property. And I think you'll find, you will find everything will be transformed. You'll see grass, grass cut, the paint gets uh, painted, the porch isn't sagging, kids are not living in squalor. I've seen kids have to live in a house where the bathroom literally fell through the floor because the, the water just soaked into the, into the rot on the floor. And what do we do? We have to go to a, we have to go to a court, it takes us nine months to get there. So that's what I would do. I think it's, it's gonna change the, it's gonna change the, the uh, fortunes of our neighborhoods uh, if we can get that done. And I'm certain that the new council will do it. Justin? Uh, one of the things we would do on day one is create the Office of the Public Health Commissioner uh, to ensure that we create a recovery plan. Uh, we have not discussed the global pandemic and COVID-19 on tonight. Uh, this uh, mayor, this administration has done a poor job just lending itself to the county and the state to lead us and create testing sites and not taking the realms and leadership on this issue. So we have to ensure that we're also looking to the CDC and all their recommendations for taste and testing and tracing uh, to ensure that we're strengthening our city and getting out of this global pandemic. Um, and there are a number of uh, systemic inequities that come along with that and around education, employment, housing, uh, mental health as a result of COVID-19. So we need to make sure that we're 
focusing on this global pandemic uh, and ensure because employees uh, in the city of Wilmington, some of them uh, were vulnerable uh, and felt like the city was not there given the proper leadership. Some went to their own doctors to get tested uh, because they found later that other people had been infected uh, or, or tested positive and they were not informed properly by the city. So this global pandemic is serious, it's serious, it's real. Uh, it's something that is still here. And we have to, as the mayor of the city of Wilmington, ensure that we are protecting our citizenry and that we are forging a plan to get out of this global pandemic and so that everyone can continue to be safe to the best of their ability and ensure that we are placing uh, precautionary measures in place to ensure that that happens. Valda. So there are two things that I would do on day one. We cannot rest as long as we have children dying in the street in this city. And so the very first thing I would do would be to pull together a commission of folks to begin to address the issue of group gun violence here in this city. There is nothing more critical than the loss of life in this city, especially among our young people and our children. We also have very real time the issue of this COVID-19 pandemic and the reopening of our city with regard to that. And so I would also on that day convene our health um, resources, connect with uh, Newcastle County, connect with the state and map out the steps for addressing a, uh, a safe reopening ensuring that our young people, as they are uh, preparing for uh, moving into, uh, back into their schools and that childcare is, um, is adequately uh, uh, managed in a way that's, that is safe. We can't begin to do that until we are well prepared with those tactical steps to make sure that happens. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we're now going to go into closing statements for each of the candidates. Everyone gets one minute to make their closing statements and we're reversing the order um, that everyone made their opening statements in. So the first closing goes to Mike. Thank you all. I'm, I'm asking your vote tonight because I honestly believe that we have a record to be very proud of, but that there is so much more to do. And I honestly believe I'm the best person equipped to continue to do it. You're gonna send one of us here tonight to negotiate with builders and developers and business leaders to help the city grow. You're gonna ask one of us to formulate a vision of the city and then execute on that vision. One of us will be charged with challenging the education system that is failing our kids. And lastly, you'll select one of us to lift up our neighborhoods and build a heavier, heavier, um, sorry, a healthier future for tomorrow. My opponents have promised us and it's up to you to guess whether they can deliver but no one has to guess what I will do over the next four years. They just have to look around and see the changes that have taken place throughout the city. They can see the investment that confidence and leadership brings. They can see the look in the face of every student going to an HBCU. They just have to visit the city county building and realize that excellence lives there. Again, I ask for your vote. Thank you. Valda. Yes, thank you um, for this forum and this opportunity to share um, my vision and um, my background and my, uh, my hopes for the city of Wilmington. Uh, sometimes in life, there comes a fork in the road, a time when each of us must choose to either continue a comfortable path of status quo or to step out of your zone and into a challenge, not for oneself, but to stand up for the benefit of others. This is such a time. My vision for the city of Wilmington is that this city will be a place where all people in our city have access and opportunity to achieve their full potential and realize their dreams for themselves and their families. 
where every child across our city receives a quality education and can play outside their home without fear. Where public leaders see the value and invest in people and neighborhoods as a key source of growth and economic prosperity. I envision a city where we work together across all zip codes of this city. And we're doing that. We all have the opportunity to rise together. Thank you for this opportunity to share my vision. And I ask for your vote on September 15th. And as you cast your mail-in ballots, I ask that you extend your vote for me as your next mayor. Thank you. All right, and Justin, you got the last word. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, caution uh, everyone that is watching tonight to look at, as the mayor said, the record. I do have a record of being elected citywide as an at-large member of council and being a com good community contributor and a neighbor. We want to restore the neighbor and neighborhoods. We want to restore the public trust to City Hall and want to bridge the gap from City Hall to every corner and quarter of our city. Um, it's important to note uh, that we must take a conscious look at what has been done, as the mayor stated, and that's been our neighborhoods have been neglected. Uh, we focus only in certain areas of our city and not focus in all of our city. And so that's important that we have to do that. Also, we want to think about um, someone that has just true, genuine leadership, understand that the city of Wilmington residents are our true heroes and our true concern, uh, and not just focus on uh, the power uh, to ensure that we have a household full of power uh, with leadership where we have a mayor and a council uh, person right in the same home to ensure that we can govern our city and push agendas forward and create uh, uh, policies of nepotism and things that have taken place in our past. So we want to make sure that we think about those things and make sure that we take a conscious effort and look at what has been done. And that is true, something that we need to do. Um, I'm reminded of a story of a father uh, he took his family on a quick trip, and he thought that uh, it was a trip that it, it was so overjoyed that he thought the children would be excited. Um, as he took the trip, uh, the quiet, it was a quiet car ride. They got to the amusement park. As they arrived to the amusement park, they spent the day there, and the children just weren't excited. And so the father went back, and he said uh, on the way home, well, what's wrong? Why, why were you not excited? Why didn't you appreciate this trip? And the children said, Dad, you never asked us what we wanted. We just wanted to be home with you, and we wanted to spend time and just get video games. And that's the disconnect that we find ourselves in in this city. We have a leader who's not connected uh, with our city and doesn't and doesn't know exactly what the citizen wants. The citizens want and doesn't care to know or even reach out uh, to ensure. So we will create town halls to ensure that everyone's voice is heard in our city of Wilmington to ensure that everyone has uh, a voice because we are Wilmington and we want to make sure that our residents understand that they matter uh, just as well as any big business that comes into our city. Uh, to kinda... your, your time's going to be going to have to wrap it up. I couldn't see Matt. Okay. All right. Well, Tuesday, September the 15th, your Democratic candidate, Justin Wright for mayor. We appreciate your support. We need your vote. Thank you if you want a real change in this city. All right. Thank you, everybody, so much for your participation. Thank you to the audience for tuning in. Um, I just want to give a little shout out to the News Journal and Delaware Online. I've been covering um, the city for about two and a half years almost now, and I do have a story up about the mayoral race, and we will have a recap of the debate up on our website tomorrow morning as well. So please read your local newspaper and um, please support us. Thank you so much. Town Hall. On behalf of the City Committee, thanks to Jeannie Kwong and the News Journal for moderating tonight's forum, and thanks to Velda Jones Potter, Mayor Mike Prozicki, and Justin Wright for engaging our voters. I'd also like to thank the City Committee members um, uh, and officers Nicholas Brock and Matt Marshall for their work in planning and running tonight's event. We'll go visit wilmdems.org to learn more about the Wilmington City Committee and keep following us here on Facebook where we will continue to have town hall forums for all city races. Finally, thanks to all of you, everyone who attended tonight's town hall. We appreciate you taking the time to get to know our mayor or candidates and in being part of this important process as we elect our mayor. Please be sure to cast your vote in the September 15th primary. Remember to check your mail or visit 
uh, ivote.de.gov to easily request your vote by mail ballot and return that ballot as soon as you can ahead of primary day. Your vote in 2020 elections is paramount to keeping our democracy working and intact. Good night, everybody, and thanks again.